Good night, community friends and our friends as well at the Downlink site. I want to welcome you to this action packed weekend. Tonight, we get started with the Mark of the Beast. And I want to welcome you again to the COVID-19 and end time messages. It's our open air series. As I said, we're in for a hectic weekend. And I would invite you to join us each night, tonight, tomorrow night, and Sunday night. Before we go into our evening session, we invite you to bow your heads with us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. Thank you, Lord, for holding back the showers, and thank you for another Sabbath day. Pray, dear Father, that you will continue to be with us as we go through tonight's proceedings. Help us, Lord, to choose you and to make decisions to prepare not only for now, but for our home in eternity. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, to present our health feature is none other than the familiar face of Elder Jason Craig. We want to thank the Lord for bringing him here safely, and we look forward to a very informative session tonight on how we can be better, how we can better take care of our health. Thank you. Elder? And this is Health Talk number five with you. Your future, your health, your future, God's plan. Your health, your future, God's plan. And, and weekend after weekend, we have been sharing this wonderful promise found in 3 John chapter 1 and verse 2, which says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. Tonight, we want to look at two more wonderful principles, two more wonderful principles, and this would be the use of water and trusting in God. The use of water and trusting in God. So, so far, so far we have looked at a few principles together. We have looked at the use of sunshine. We have looked at the use of so so here we go. So we are looking at the use of water and trust in divine power. In the book of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from hence it was parted and became, and became into four. Now we see that, you know, when, when we looked at the, the account in Genesis, we recognized that in, in, in the first few days that God created the, the atmosphere. And now we are seeing that he created a wonderful, wonderful river, which divided into four parts, right? The use of water. In John chapter 9 and verse, verses 6 and 7, it says, When he had thus spoken, he spat, on, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Shalom, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Now, we see that the, 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 the natural remedy of, of clay or the, or the clay was combined with the use of water. And this man, trusting in God, went forth following the instructions 
and we see how water was used to restore through the, the power and grace of God was able to restore this man's sight. Now, the sufferers in such cases can do for themselves what, that which others cannot do as well for them. They should commence to relieve nature of the load they have forced upon her. So, so by our choices, we bring burdens upon the body. By our choices, they should remove the cause. Fast a short time and give the stomach a rest, a chance for rest. Reduce the frivolous state of the system by careful and understanding application of water. So the use of water can bring great relief to the body. Great relief. Now these efforts will help nature in her struggles to free the system of impurities. Water is a very useful and helpful tool. Water can be used in many ways to relieve suffering. Drafts of clear hot water taken before eating, half a quart more or less, will never do any harm, but will, pro but will rather be productive of good. So we have noticed that water can be very, very useful. I know personally... I have used water to, in, in, in certain situations, and it has benefited me as an individual. Now, what we want to look at is trusting in divine power. Is trusting in God important? Now, we would have learned many wonderful principles, but we recognize without God's help, we cannot receive the healing that is necessary in order for us to, to realize the promise found in 3 John chapter 1 and verse 2. So how important is trusting in God? The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, not with some of thine heart, but with all of thine heart. And lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways, in all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. So as we have learned these principles and as we seek to implement them into our lives, we, we realize that we must give total trust to God for, to receive the blessing. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 and 8, you know, it, we, we, we are now looking at should we trust in man? Because so, so often, we tend to lean towards man's wisdom. But in Jeremiah chapter 17 and ver verses 6 and 8, it says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is God. The Lord is our hope. He is our salvation. For he shall be like, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters. And that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when he cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. So, so the, the, this scenario is like unto us trusting in God. When we put our full weight upon him, the blessings are realized. Proverbs chapter 22 and verses 19, it says that thy trust may be in the Lord. I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. So our trust is to be in God. Have I not written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge? that I might make thee known the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. There is power in trusting the word and promises of God. And here is a very wonderful promise. He, God is wanting to put us in perfect peace. And in Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4, it says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, 
whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. In, in Jesus, there is everlasting strength. And as we seek to apply these wonderful principles to our lives, then the blessing will be realized. We thank you for listening to your health, your future, God's plan. Thank you, Elder Craig, for the timely reminder on water. And certainly in these times where it's so unpredictable and in such turmoil all over the world, it is indeed helpful to remember that we can put our trust in one man, the man Christ Jesus. Tonight, to present tonight's message on the mark of the beast is none other than my better half, Pastor Winston Cook. And without further ado, before he presents tonight's message, we will go into our theme song. And then the next voice you will hear is the preacher for tonight. The humming king is at the door. Who wants to cross with sin is born? But now the righteous one alone. He's coming again, and he's even at the door. He's even at the door. Want to say a special good night to the community of Denskin, Spring Farm, Pori Spring, and surrounding districts. Those of you who are online, whether you be in the Arch Hall, Rock Hall, or even in my sister churches, Time Bottom with Pilgrim Road, Canville, or whether you are listening in the Moriah area, we just want to say welcome. Even for you, those of you who are online um, out of Barbados, we want to say welcome. We thank you for joining in, and we pray that you have been blessed so far, and we believe that by God's grace, you will continue to be blessed as we go through tonight's presentation. As I said early on, help me, help this is our final weekend. We will be presenting the mark of the beast tonight, the mark of the beast and the seal of God. Tomorrow night, God's spear life, we will look at the, the change of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. How did that happen? 
And then on Sunday night, the coming Sunday law. The coming Sunday law. May God bless us as we take this journey together. And may we have a better understanding of the times that we're living in and what is required to get ready for the soon coming of Jesus. I invite you at this time, wherever you are, to bow your heads with me in prayer. Loving God, in the precious name of Jesus, we come to you on this Sabbath Eve, thanking you for the blessings of the week. We recognize, Lord, that we are sinful, and so we plead the precious blood of Jesus. We ask for cleansing. Wash us in the blood. Cover us, Lord. We pray even now that you will bind the powers of darkness and allow your word, God, free course again one more time and that those who hear will understand the voice of God speaking to their souls and will yield completely. And at last, may we be ready for your soon coming. In Jesus' name, amen. The mark of the beast and the seal of God. The warning against worshiping the beast is the most urgent message given in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, the Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worships the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20 says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived all that received the mark of the beast. And them that worship his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. That is a very serious warning for those who will receive the mark of the beast. Is the mark of the beast the receiving of the RFID chip technology? You know, there are many theories going around about the mark of the beast. And, and one of the theories is that the chip technology constitutes the mark of the beast. But is that what the Bible says? Tonight, we will examine what the Bible says about the mark of the beast. And beyond a shadow of a doubt, we will see from scripture and from history, what constitutes the mark of the beast. With such a serious warning against worshiping the beast and receiving his mark, the question can be asked, has God given us any more information as to who this beast might be? Do we understand from the word of God, who the beast is. I believe it would make good sense understanding who the beast power is and then we will get a better understanding as to what his mark might be. What does the Bible say? In Revelation chapter 13, Verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, And I look, 
upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as a mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So the Bible says that this beast that rose up out of the sea had seven heads and ten horns. In a previous presentation, we explained to you that this beast power succeeded several other powers. Power one being the Roman, sorry, the Babylonian Empire. Succeeded by the Medo Persia Empire. Succeeded by the Grecian Empire. And then the Roman Empire. And then the power that succeeded the Roman Empire was the Papal Empire. So pagan Rome was then succeeded by Papal Rome. But seven heads, seven heads. The first head would have been the Babylonian head. The second head would have been Media Persia. Then the Grecian head with its four-headed beast would have given it six heads. And then pagan Rome would have been the seven head. Pagan Rome was then succeeded or dissolved into ten empires. So you have the seven heads and the ten crowns. If you look, however, also at the, the images of the beast, you have the lion, which was Babylon. You have the bear, which is Media Persia. The four-headed leper, which is Greece. And then the nondescript beast, which was pagan Rome. Seven heads, ten horns. Daniel chapter 7, verse 17, the Bible says, These great beasts, which are four, there are four kings or four kingdoms, which shall arise out of the earth. So this beast's power in Revelation 13 succeeds all of these previous kingdoms. Let's look at some clues to understand this power. Clue number one. The dragon gave him his power. The dragon gave this beast its power. Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 identifies the dragon as Satan. But we well know that Satan works through human agencies. In Revelation chapter 12, the dragon working through pagan Rome attempted to destroy Jesus. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3 and 4, the Bible says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. And he still drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. We well know that Satan used pagan Rome in attempt to destroy Jesus before he started his mission. It was a Roman official who tried to kill baby Jesus. It was a Roman governor who condemned Jesus. A Roman executioner who crucified Jesus. And it was the Roman emblem that sealed his tomb. And a Roman guard was set to watch the tomb. 
So Satan, using pagan Rome to seek to hinder the mission of Jesus. Lebianca, professor of history, says, to the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff or to the pope. So clue number one is, he was given his seat and authority by the dragon. Clue number two, this power is a worldwide religious power. A worldwide religious power. Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So it's a worldwide religious power. We told you before that the word Catholic means universal. Universal. Yeah? So this beast power is a universal church. It's, it has adherents all around the world. It commands worship. Clue number three. It's a religious power dominating civil powers. Revelation chapter 13 verse 7 says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given, given him over all kindreds and towns and nations. So this power has authority over civil powers to the extent that it is able to to persecute people all around. Meyer's general history says, on the hymn, that's the papacy, was very nearly made good. The papal claim that all earthly sovereigns were merely vassals of the Roman pontiff. Almost all of the kings and princes of Europe swore fealty or loyalty to him as their overlord, Rome was once more the mistress of the world. Clue number four says that the power is a blasphemous power. Revelation chapter 13 verse 6, the Bible says, And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. What is blasphemy, you may ask? What is blasphemy? In John chapter 10, verse 33, it says, The Jews answered him, that's Jesus saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So Jesus, when he walked this earth, he did many mighty miracles. He also forgives sins because he is God. And the Jews, intending to get rid of Jesus, they said, listen, we're not, we don't, we don't, we're not treating you this way because of the miracles, not because of the good deeds you've done, but you are taking unto yourself prerogatives or powers that belong to God because only God can forgive sins. But what they did not understand was that Jesus was fully man and also fully God. The Bible defines blasphemy, therefore, as assuming any right or power that belongs to God. This power, as found in Revelation 13, assumes powers that belong to God. Pope Leo XIII says, we hold upon this earth the place of Almighty God. <laughs> uh, the Pope has power, they say, to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. 
If that's not blasphemy, I don't know what is. We also know that the papacy claims that they have power to forgive sins. Clue number five. This power is a religious power which reigns supreme for 1,260 years. What does the Bible say? Revelation 13, 5. It says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now, forty-two months in the Jewish reckoning, because a month for the Jews in biblical time was thirty days. So forty-two months will be 1260 days but in bible prophecy a day represents a year ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6 says i have appointed thee each day for a year so this power would rule supremely for 1260 years History recalls that the legally recognized supremacy of the Pope began in 538 A.D. When there went into effect a decree of Emperor Justinian making the Bishop of Rome head over all of the churches, the definer of doctrines, and the corrector of heretics. History says that Vigilius, that's Pope Vigilius, he ascended the papal chair in 538 A.D. under the military protection of Belisarius. So the papal rule began in 538 A.D. 1,260 years would bring us to 1798 A.D. What event occurred in 1798 that brought an end to papal supremacy. The, in the Encyclopedia of Americana, 1941 edition, it says in 1798, Berthier, that's General Berthier, Napoleon's general, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. And that brought the supremacy of the papal power to an end. Revelation chapter 13, verse 9 and 10 says, If any man have an ear to hear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity, he must go into captivity. And he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Clue number six says, that the deadly wound of this power was healed. Revelation chapter 13 verse 3 says, And I saw one of his heads as it were healed to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. So the Bible predicts, yes, that the papal supremacy will come to an end. But it also predicts that its wound will be healed and again it will reign supreme. 1929, the San Francisco Chronicle, February 11 says, The Roman question tonight was a thing of the past and the Vatican was at peace with Italy. In affixing the autographs to the memorable document, healing the wound, Extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. What we are talking about is the Lateran Treaty, the agreement that brought the papacy back into power, establishing again the Roman or the papal state, uh, making it an independent state, and even providing it with an army and much land. So in 1929, the deadly wound was healed. Clue number seven says that the, the beast power 
and the end time would have worldwide dominance. Worldwide dominance in the end time. And if you open your eyes, if you are in tune with what's happening, you will, you, you will understand indeed that the papacy again is having worldwide influence. Revelation 13 3 says, And all the world wandered after the beast. Times Magazine calls him the people's pope. <laughs> Says the papacy has gained worldwide influence, prestige, and prominence. Papacy strikes deal with China on appointment of bishops. Pope increases in his, his influence. The Vatican and China said yesterday uh, they had signed a, a historic agreement on the appointment of Roman Catholic bishops a breakthrough on an issue that for decades had fueled tensions between the Holy See and Beijing and had thwarted efforts toward diplomatic relations. But now, things are good. The papacy and Muslim relations. Uh, the leader of the largest independent Muslim organization, organization in the world met Pope Francis. And they presented a joint vision, uh, a vision of a peaceful future and greater human fraternity. The leader of the 50 million member strong movement, which calls for a reform, a human, humanitarian Islam, and has developed a theological framework for Islam that rejects the concepts of caliphate, Sharia law, and kafri. So the papacy and the Muslim movement are even in closer relation. Papacy calls for leadership. Papal leadership call. Rome, Pope Francis is inviting world leaders and young people to come together at the Vatican on May 14, 2020. This was published in 2019. This was a call by the Pope for all world leaders and young people to come and to discuss a global educational alliance speaking about climate change. But we well understood that this year, because of the COVID-19, that meeting had to be postponed. But then there was a virtual council in October of 2020 on the same summit. The Pope called for world leaders. Now I can call for world leaders and you would laugh at me because they wouldn't come. But when the Pope called for world leaders, they attend. That's the power of the papacy. Even our Prime Minister Mayor Motley called on the papacy. Prime Minister Mayor Motley has called for a new global leadership initiative that would change how some decisions are made for more vulnerable countries seeking financial and other assistance in a post-COVID-19 era. I am sure if you were listening, you would have heard that she did not call on the Anglican bishop, but she called on Pope Francis, suggesting that the new Global Leadership Initiative would include all world leaders, including Pope Francis, the head of the Roman Catholic Church. Prime Minister Motley said, the time had long passed for a review of how the depth of vulnerable countries were responded to and restructured. And she called for the involvement of Pope Francis. Just last week, last week Tuesday, the article came out, says, big businesses, big business gets its wings as leaders from major U.S. companies partnered with Pope Francis. Wow. Capitalism met catalysm, catalysm on Tuesday as some of the world's biggest businesses and investment leaders announced a new partnership with Pope Francis. 
just last Tuesday. The Bible says, and the world wandered after the beast. Some of you may think that this is just something that the Adventist church teaches about the papacy. But many of the reformers held the same view that the papacy was the Antichrist. Wycliffe, Tyndale, Luther, Calvin, Cranmer, in the 17th century, Bunyan, the translators of the King James Bible, and the men who published the Westminster and the Baptist Confessions of Faith, Sir Isaac Newton, Wesley, Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, and even Spurgeon all saw the office of the papacy as anti-Christ. So if this is not Seventh-day Adventist teaching. There is a great cloud of witnesses who share the same view. John Wesley, in his explanatory notes on Revelation 13, this is what he said. He says, out of the sea, that is Europe, this beast is the Romish papacy. As it came to a point 600 years since, stands now and will for some time longer. He says, to this and no other power on earth agrees the whole text and every part of it in every point. That was the conviction of John Wesley as he read and studied Revelation 13. He concluded that that, that text pointed to the papacy. Daniel, seven little horn, Revelations 13 beasts, Revelation 17, Babylon, all point to the papacy. Let us go. So we have now identified the beast, the first beast of Revelation 13. We've identified the beast power. The question to, be, to ask and to be answered, what specifically is the mark of the beast. We know who the beast is. The beast is the papacy. What is the mark? The mark of the beast must be the sign of the Roman church's authority. Let's see what they say is their mark of authority. Catholic records September 1, 1923. This is what they say. They say Sunday is our mark of authority. That's what they say. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Uh, here's another quote from the Catholic. It says, of course, the Catholic church claims that the change was her act that the change was her act, and that act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Wow. So they're not denying it. They're not denying it. The papacy says, we changed the Sabbath, and the fact that we were able to do that, that's our mark of authority. St. Catherine Catholic Church, Sentinel, May 21, 1995. And I quote, says, perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century, it says the holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday, not from any direction, Noted from the scriptures, but from the but not from Christ. Yes, not there's there's no scriptural evidence for the change, but from a sense of the church's own power. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority 
should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. Now, that's not what the Seventh-day Adventist church says. That's what the papacy says. She says, if you really believe in the Bible, then you ought to be keeping the Seventh-day Saturday as the Sabbath. Wow. Question to be asked tonight and answered. Does anyone have the mark of the beast today? Does anyone have the mark of the beast today? No one. No one will receive the mark of the beast until religious legislation is passed and enforcing the substitute Sabbath. There will come a time when there will be laws that will enforce the observance of the false Sabbath. And at that time, men and women will have to make a decision as to whom they will obey. Then and only then will people receive the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 13 verse 11 through 7 says, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. We'll talk more about that on Sunday night. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. And causeth the earth and them which dwell therein. To worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the womb by the sword and did live. Scripture continues, it says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and born, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Friends of mine, there's going to come a time, and I believe it's not too far ahead, there are going to be two groups of persons in the end time. Those who will receive the mark of the beast and those who will receive the seal of God. The seal of God. You will either receive the mark of the beast or you will receive the seal of God. Revelation chapter 7 verse 1 to 3 says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any three. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So in the end of time, Persons will either receive the mark of the beast or they will receive 
the seal of the living God. You may ask tonight, what is the seal of God? We've already established what the mark of the beast is. What is the seal of God? The seal of God stands in contrast with the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 14 verse 9 to 12, the Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worships the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, uh, no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Then Revelation 14, 12 concludes like this. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12 shows you a different group of people. The preceding verses spoke about those who would receive the mark of the beast and the wrath of God. Then Revelation 14, 12 says, look, here is the patience of the saints. The saints will not receive the mark of the beast and the saints will not receive the wrath of God. Here is the patience of the saints and the saints are identified as those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. I want us to reason together tonight. Come let us reason together, saith the Lord. If the saints are identified as those who are keeping the commandments of God, then those who will receive the mark of the beast and the wrath of God will not be keeping the commandments of God. Mm. We're talking about the seal of God. So God's seal is in the heart of God's law. In Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16, the Bible says, Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. Bind up the testimony and seal the law among my disciples. When we're talking about a seal, a seal of a country contains three things. The name of the ruler, their title, and their territory. Example, if we are talking about the seal of Barbados, the seal of the government of Barbados would contain Mia Motley, Honorable Mia Amor Motley. That was her name. That's her name. Her title would be Prime Minister. Her name, her title, Prime Minister. And her territory is Barbados. Not the rest of the world. Just Barbados. The seal of God, which is found in his law, has also to bear his name, his title, and his territory. And in the midst of the Ten Commandments, there is one commandment that carries the seal of God. It's the fourth commandment. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 11. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath 
of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we're looking at the seal of God. The seal of God has to contain the three elements. Has to contain his name. For in six days, the Lord. That's his name. He's the Lord God. The Lord. Amen. Uh, has to contain his title. Uh, what did he do? He is the creator. The Lord God made. He created. That's his title. Lord God. Creator. Ah, uh, What's his territory? He's creator of the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. So in the fourth commandment is contained the seal of God. So for the papacy, the mark of the beast, that's Sunday. They say Sunday is the mark of our authority. And God says, Sabbath is the seal of my authority. In Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12, it says, Moreover also I give them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Romans chapter 4, verse 11, speaking about Abraham, it says, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness. So sign and seal are interchangeable. Abraham received the sign of circumcision, which was the seal of righteousness. So Sabbath is God's sign, it's God's seal. Friends of mine, brothers and sisters, there's a choice to be made. There's a choice to be made. And sooner or later, this choice will have to be made. What's the choice? <laughs> we will either receive the mark of the beast Sunday, or we will accept the seal of God, Sabbath. That's the choice. I want you to note the difference here. Note that the seal of God is received in the forehead only. The seal of God is received in the forehead only. While the mark of the beast is received in the forehead or in the hand. Yeah? In the forehead or in the hand. Those who receive the seal of God are those who believe the word of God and stand firm and true to the word of God. They're not just going along with what somebody say. They sincerely believe it and they are standing by the word of God. So it is received only in the forehead. You must make that decision. Come now, let us reason together. You have to choose the seal of God. You've got to believe it with all your heart. But when it comes to the mark of the beast, there are some who believe it, but there are others who will go along with it for convenience or, or because they want to buy and sell and they don't want to be disadvantaged 
So they will accept the mark of the beast, not in their forehead, but in their hand. They will give service. The apostles, when called to make a decision about standing for Jesus, in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, this is what was said. It says, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And I pray God tonight, just like Peter and the other apostles, that we too will choose to obey God rather than man. May God help us to make the right choice. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share this important message. We do believe, Lord, with all our heart that these are the times we are living in and the people need to be warned. We pray, O oh God, that your spirit will make your word clear and that men and women will be courageous enough to stand on the side of truth and not tradition. Give us a good night's rest. Take us to our journeys in peace and in safety and bring us back out tomorrow night to hear another word from you is our prayer with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, friends of mine, we want to thank you for being with us tonight. Tomorrow night, we come back, God spare our life, and we will look at the subject from Sabbath to Sunday. Who did it? God bless you. change in my life had been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which I have not sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Lots of joy, oh my soul, like the sea will all roll Since Jesus came into my heart I have ceased from my wandering and gone astray Since Jesus came into my heart And my sins, which were many, are all washed away Since Jesus came into my heart Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart. For the soul joy, oh my soul, like the sea billows roll, since Jesus came into my heart. I shall go there to dwell in that city I know, since Jesus came into my heart. I am happy, so happy as onward I go Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Love so joy, oh my soul Like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart. In Matthew chapter 24 is listed on the sixth side. But what is the pestilence? The pestilence is a deadly and overwhelming disease that affects an entire community. Now the coronavirus has not just affected a community, but it has